طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله uh, Welcome today for uh, this uh, like Vav's MCQs uh, At the start I would like to ask everybody to keep his uh, live voice mute and calm as well Thank you for all uh, for this attendance It's my pleasure My name is Dr. Muhammad Bara I am consultant uh, cardiology in King Fair Medical City at Riyadh So today I will divide my presentation to two parts. The first one hour, it will become like just a vertical MCQs in cardiac valves. And the second part or the second hour will give you just uh, some interesting or changing cases of echo, like short cases or like coding system. So, uh, you know, most of the valves MCQs in the exam, what I remember were like long uh, story or long scenario. But sometimes the answer is in the question itself. So understanding the question, likely will have 50% of the answer correct. So I will read the question for you uh, just uh, quickly. And I would like ask uh, anybody know the knows to write it in the chat box. Uh, unless if somebody have question or he doesn't understand, uh, he can write his question as well. So just this is just to minimize the interruption and the noises. Uh, I have like 18 scenario, but likely we cannot finish all of them. So we'll try to take as much as we can. As you know, the MCQs of BAV, as well as most of the cardiology board or intermission board, usually when they are asking or concentrating or emphasizing on the management. Management mean investigations, workup, and treatment. So, Bismillah, we'll start with the first one. So, question number one The bicuspid aortic valve is associated with all but which one of the following disease and complication? Number one, correctation of the aorta. B, aortic dissection. C, infective endocarditis. D, myxomatous mitral valve and E, ascending aortic aneurysm. So I will give you likely 20 to 30 seconds to answer. So these disease or complications may happen with bicuspid aortic valve except one of them. So which one? Please uh, write like, uh, like a figure, okay? or letter A, B, C, D, or E. Because the three, I don't know what, what do you mean by three here. Okay, some people, they said B, and the others said C, D. So <laughs> I thought this is the most easiest question. I start by the most easiest question, but seems a bit difficult. So most of you said D, which is, we'll see the answer now. Yeah, that's right. So D. So as we see here, uh, bicuspid aortic valve is a genetic disorder. Okay. And this is congenital anomaly of the heart. This is, uh, the incidence is about usually 2% of the population. It is more common in male than female. And it may associate with other, uh, like other congenital anomaly or other complication. So it may be associated with aneurysm of aorta, and dissection and coarctation as well. And we know that about 5% of patients with bicuspid aortic valve have coarctation of aorta. And it may be complicated with infective endocarditis. However, it is not indication to give prophylaxis. But it is not related to myxomatous mitral valve. Uh, the myxomatous mitral valve, if associated with anything in the aorta, usually with aortic aneurysm, this is usually happen in Marfan disease, but they don't have usually bicuspid. They will have myxomatous uh, aortic valve, but usually try leaflet and there is significant AI and there is dilated aortic root because of the hyper elasticity plus myxomatous mitral valve. So question two. Okay, I will read the scenario, then we'll have the question. I will emphasize on the important point in this uh, question. So 77 year old man with a chronic angina pectoris for three years. He had increasing symptoms for the past six weeks with episodes at rest, nocturnal episode, 
and prolonged episodes with effort often requiring two to three sublingual nitroglycerin instead of the usual one tablet at rest for relief. His overall health is good. He is known to have aortic stenosis of moderate degree with typical findings. Blood pressure 140 over 80, heart rate 72. His carotid pulses show delayed upstock. There is no JVB or no jugular vein distension or basal thrill. The apical impulse is localized but enlarged and forceful. There is no aortic second sound and a typical music murmur of calcified, calcified aortic stenosis. So until now we have many features of significant aortic stenosis. His ECG shows moderate voltage for LV hypertrophy, flattening of the T waves and left atrial abnormality and no suggestion of myocardial infarction or injury. An angiographic study showed major narrowing in the proximal portion of all three of his coronary trunks. Diffuse disease throughout the arteries, but good distal vessel. So there is moderate narrowing in the left main. Uh, pull back mean gradient was 30 millimeter mercury across the aortic valve. Okay, the valve is heavily calcified. The ejection fraction was estimated as 55 to 60 percent. So now the question, which of these management strategies is preferred? A, cabbage without aortic valve replacement. B, increase medical therapy by adding beta blocker. C, perform a thallium test to localize ischemia and perform intentional incompetence. Revascularization with BCI. D, dobutamine stress test to study the ischemia and evaluate the gradient during stress, gradient of aortic valve. And finally, E, cabbage with aortic valve replacement. Okay, so yeah, many people said E. We will see. Yeah, that's right. So the answer is cabbage with aortic valve replacement. Okay, so can I know why you want to do? We know cabbage because there is significant left main disease and three vessel, but why you want to do aortic valve replacement? Is it moderate AR or severe AR or why? Can you write? Is moderate or severe? And I will go back to this slide. Yeah, somebody said surgery because patient go to surgery. Excellent. Excellent, Dr. Ammar. Calf underestimate gradient. Calf underestimate the aortic valve gradient. Why? This is mean gradient 30, or this is, sorry, this is pull back. So this is peak to peak. While our peak gradient in echo, usually it is not peak to peak. This is what we call instantaneous gradient, okay? Maximum instantaneous gradient. And this usually is higher than the peak to peak in the cath or uh, invasive hemodynamic. So likely this head is underestimated. And this is likely severe aortic stenosis, especially with presence of our all of these clinical findings and clinical exam, and even the history. So this is clinically severe AS, and by ECG as well, there is LVH, and the gradient is likely higher than 30. So this is severe AS. However, even if you have moderate aortic stenosis, the best management here, if the patient has 77, is to go to uh, cabbage, especially in presence of lift main, plus aortic valve replacement. We'll go to the third question now. Of course, I will keep this, uh, I will later can share uh, you this, uh, like all this PowerPoint presentation to find the answer, because I don't like to read the answer theoretically, I want to explain more. So question number three, 55 year old African American man, Referred to you for evaluation of a murmur. The murmur was first noted five years ago. He denies any symptoms, but admit that he has always done little physical activity. He states that he no longer walks to the office and doesn't have to walk stairs to the third floor because there is an elevator. Physical example, pressure 110 over 70, plus 80, respiration normal, neck vein 5 centimeter. Carotid abstract is normal without a brewery. Lungs are clear, 
point of maximal impulse is diffuse in the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line and forceful. First and second heart sounds are normal. There is a grade three systolic murmur crescendo to the second sound. Best hard at the apex, but radiating well to the base. There are no S4 or S3 gallop and no other abnormality. In ACD, you have LVH by voltage and no STT changes. Valve to the echo doubler. There is floppy mitral valve, severe posterior leaflet prolapse, moderately to severe MR with the jet directed anterior medially. LV in diastolic diameter is 5.8 centimeter and left atrium diameter is enlarged. Ejection fraction is 45 to 50. So the question, what is the most appropriate recommendation for treatment for this patient? A, follow medically with close observation and repeat echo if there is clinical change. B, start in April, repeat echo in four months. C, send for surgery for mitral valve replacement. D, send to surgery for mitral valve repair. Or E, start long-acting nifedipine and repeat echo in one year. So we'll go back to the question. Now the, the question say, uh, said there is like moderate to severe MR, it is floppy mitral valve and severe prolapse of the posterior leaflet. And there is dilatation of LV and ejection fraction is bit impaired. So yeah, many people said the correct answer. So the correct answer here is D, same surgery for mitral valve repair. And why we said repair, of course, Number one, the patient has the rotation of left ventricle and he has a uh, drop of ejection fraction, even if he's asymptomatic. Likely he's asymptomatic because he has very sedentary lifestyle. He has elevator, he doesn't want to walk. But if you put the patient on treadmill or stress, likely you'll have symptoms. <clears throat> so usually if you have prolapse of one leaflet, mainly posterior, the uh, result of repair is very excellent, especially if you have just isolated posterior mitral leaflet prolapse. If you have even anterior, also the likelihood is high, but still less than posterior. But if you have like myxomatous or Barlow valve disease, and most of the scallops of posterior and anterior leaflet are prolapsing, the likelihood is less here. But usually if he'll ask you in prolapse, he will give you this scenario, and here is repair. But if he telling you, is he telling you that most of the leaflets are prolapsing with barlow, myxomatous, whatever? So the answer is replacement. Okay. <clears throat> Question number four. This is likely easy. 65-year-old retired female school teacher referred to you from a rural community hospital because of suspected infected endocarditis based on persistent fever, mitral regurg murmur a microscopic hematuria. All initial blood cultures were negative at the time of the transfer. Apparently, a neighbor had given the patient an available bottle of antibiotics when she seemed to have developed the flu. The nursing staff reports multiple GOAC positive stool specimen shortly after admission. A TE demonstrated vegetation on the mitral valve. A gastroenterology consultant recommends colonoscopy and identifies a circumferential carcinoma in the transverse colon. <clears throat> so, you would predict that her eventually positive blood culture demonstrate which microbe? A, Streptococcus pyogenes, B, Streptococcus mitos, or what you call viridens, C, Streptococcus bovis, D, Staphylococcus aureus, or A, Staphylococcus epidermidis. I think this is a very common question, even in the internal medicine board. Okay, still I'm waiting some answers. Till now, just to answer. Okay, well, now we have four or five uh, answers which are correct. C. So you know, if you have any cancer in the abdomen or the the intestine, colon, likely the organism is Streptococcus bovis. Okay, and the treatment for this usually should involve 
many antibiotic uh, like uh, especially vancomycin. Question number five. 21 year old IV drug abuser came to the hospital with fever and malaise over three weeks duration. His chest film showed dry sided pneumonia and bilateral poor effusion. The initial examination was remarkable for respiratory wheeze and dullness at the right base. So like he has pneumonia. There were prominent C and V waves in the jugular venous pulse and a hyperdynamic precordium was noted. Grade three cystic murmur was audible, most predominantly along the left sternal border. Five or six blood culture were positive for Pseudomonas ergonosa, and the patient was started on tobromycin and piperacillin. However, after three weeks, he had persistent fever to 100 Fahrenheit, and uh, there is low lymphedema, and blood cultures were again positive for Pseudomonas. So the patient has persistent, uh, like septicemia or bacteremia or Pseudomonas. So appropriate therapy at this time would be A, an additional four weeks of treatment with higher doses of tubromycin and piperacillin, B, antibiotic change to tubromycin and ceftazidime and given for additional four weeks, C, tricuspid valvulectomy without replacement by a prosthetic valve and antibiotic treatment for four weeks, D, tricuspid valve replacement by hancock borsin processes and antibiotic for four weeks, or a tricuspid valve replacement by St. Jude mechanical processes and continue antibiotic for four weeks. Okay. <clears throat> We have some people now answering. Uh, okay, D, E, 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 interesting. Yeah, interesting. So most of the people answered E. Good. So the correct answer is, let's discuss. This patient has likely right-sided, right-sided uh, infective endocarditis. He is young male and he has IV drug abuse. So, and he has pneumonia, and likely is complicated now by infective endocarditis. And the clinical exam is suggestive of tricuspid valve regurg. Okay, so once you have an IV drug abuser, likely now you'll have destruction of the tricuspid valve. Okay, still left sided uh, endocarditis, it may happen with IV drug abuser, but less common than right side. So the issue here that the patient has persistent bacteremia. So there is no rule for just continuing antibiotic without intervention. And these symptoms are suggestive of now right side heart failure. And even exam, the patient has memory, has high JVB and hyperdynamic precordium. So now we are talking about, and the low lipidema. So we are talking about now what? Right side heart failure. So we have definitely to manage the tricuspid valve. But most of the people, they said to replace by mechanical valve. Okay. So now the answer is no. The answer we have to replace by tissue valve. When I said the pulsing valve, this is usually tissue valve. There is no rule for mechanical uh, tricuspid valve replacement. Very rarely, and remember that, to replace the right side valves, either tricuspid or primary, with mechanical. Why? Because there is a very high chance of thrombosis on this valve. You believe and you know that the thrombosis of mitral valve is high, okay, higher than aortic valve because of lower flow. And even the flow is less across the tricuspid valve. The velocity is less, okay? Maybe the flow is the same, of course, but the velocity is less. So the chance of uh, uh, thrombosis is higher and you have to keep the patient on higher INR level and warfarin for life. And the thrombus, thrombosis, of this tricuspid valve replacement by tissue valve is very, very, very rare. We know that thrombosis of tissue mitral valve is rare, but in tricuspid or bombing valve is also more rare. Okay, very rare. So there is no rule to replace uh, the tricuspid valve by mechanical unless, unless if you have a suspicion that this valve would generate quickly. 
okay so anybody can write in the chat give me one scenario you ha we have to replace tricuspid valve by mechanical valve just write in the chat which case or scenario if you have severe tr or severe tricuspid stenosis you have to replace the tricuspid valve with mechanical there is usually not good result with the uh, tissue valve because this tissue valve quickly will stenose and will have severe stenosis again and regurg. Okay, somebody said end stage disease is not correct because usually it will not degenerate quickly. Somebody said patient post radiation cannot redo. And the correct answer mentioned by somebody is carcinoid. Excellent, carcinoid. Usually, it's better to replace tricuspid valve by, by mechanical valve. Good. We'll go to the next question. 66-year-old female evaluated for the first time in your office for dyspnea. The patient complains of dyspnea and wheezing with minimal activity. So, this is heart failure. She also noticed sleeping on two to three pillows at night. This is BND for the past few months to help with her breathing. She was originally seen in her primary care provider's office one week ago, who noticed an unusual member on physical exam. Past medical history is significant for hypothyroidism and osteoporosis, for which she takes levothyroxine 75 microgram per day, along with calcium vitamin D supplementation. Physical exam, blood pressure 135 over 78, heart rate 88 regular, Respiration normal, oxygen saturation is normal in room air. The pertinent findings include mild by basal rails without finding of consolidation and a regular rate and rhythm with prominent, prominent S1. And there is opening snap and a diastolic crumble. No systolic members are auscultated. An echocardiogram is performed and shows the, uh, the following findings. Ejection fraction, 50 to 55 person. Mitral leaflet commissures fused, mitral score of seven, mean mitral valve gradient of nine, and mitral valve area of 1.1 centimeters square. Estimated pulmonary artery pressure of 40 millimercury, with the reminder of the exam being essentially normal. So, which of the following would be the most suitable for this patient? A. Mitral valve replacement. B. Initiated diuretic therapy. C, recommend percutaneous mitral balloon valvotomy. D, initiate beta blocker therapy. Okay, excellent. Uh, all the answer said C, which is the correct answer. So, uh, anybody can just uh, open the mic, okay, or I sell, I have to select just one, open them, uh, better to select. Type, uh, Dr. Uh, I think Dr. Saad Ma'ana, Saad al Bagmi, or Ammar Saig, one of you, please. No, if I open the, open the mics all for answer, it will have. تفضل. Why you choose a percutaneous mitral balloon valvoplasty? Uh, score below eight, uh, severe and uh, uh, favorable. شو uh, for uh, valvoplasty? Okay, because. طب, can you just tell me first, this uh, mitral stenosis is moderate or severe, and why? Is it severe or this is moderate with symptoms? Uh, said, clinical said, examination is going with severe opening snap, uh, prominent S1. Okay, good. Excellent. Prominent S1, opening snap, diastolic crumble. And, but the grade is 9, still in the moderate range. What about the area? 1.1. Area is severe also, below 1.5. Yeah, so area less than 1.5 is considered severe mitral stenosis. If the area less than one, this is called very severe mitral stenosis. Remember this number. So the gradient is 
very less dependent. We are not dependent more on grade nowadays. We are depending mainly on the area, and this area could be by planimetry, preferred by 3D planimetry by transvisual echo, or 2D planimetry by transversal echo on short axis. And the other is pulmonary, uh, the pressure half time. If pressure half time more than 150 in native valve, this is considered severe as well. The gradient, you have a lot of like uh, coincidence may over or underestimate the severity. So the other point now that this score will can score here is seven. So anything eight or less consider very favorable for percutaneous valvulosity. If 12 and more, this is not favorable and likely it will be complicated by rupture or perfusion of the leaflet or like just embolization of calcium, okay, and severe matter regurgitation. That's why we have not to do. Between 8 and 12, it may be considered according to the risk of surgery. The patient has a bit higher risk. We can send him for this. Okay. And I will tell you something. I will tell you something. This is very common to bring in the exam that the patient has, uh, she's a pregnant lady. Because many times, the rheumatic matter stones will discover during pregnancy. Okay, because the patient will have overload because of the a lot of fluid collection and like hormonal issues and fluid retention. And they start to have complaint. Somebody will put a scope, he will have murmur or whatever, and they will do echo, they will discover severe MS. So uh, remember, always whenever you have pregnancy scenario of metastenosis, the answer most of the time is to do balloon valve during the second trimester. We are not doing in the first because there is still risk of radiation, uh, like uh, uh, side effects to the fetus, cogeta anomaly during the first trimester. And we should not delay the patient till the third trimester because like a scenario will be complicated more and they will have more pulmonary hypertension, okay, and symptoms of heart failure. And uh, she may not tolerate Okay, pregnancy till the end. And the patient may go to delivery or CS at any time. So it's high risk. So always you have to do this balloon valve during the second trimester with shield over her abdomen to protect the fetus. Okay. And always remember that uh, contraindication for valvotomy. If you have calcified non bleibble valve, or high score, or if you have left atrial appendage or left atrial thrombus, or if you have moderate and more than moderate mitral regurg. All of these are contraindication for balloon valvoblasty. Question number seven. 15, please concentrate on this question is a bit uh, difficult and tricky. 15 year old patient presents with three days of flu-like symptoms and sharp right side the chest pain with inspiration, so likely pleurisy. Physical exam shows blood pressure normal, pulse normal, temperature 100 Fahrenheit. So it is just mildly elevated. Respiration rate 20. And uh, the head and neck and the ENT exam is negative, except for the buggy nasal mucosa. There is no bus. The JVB is normal, carotid with slow upstroke. Okay. Carotid with slow upstroke, palpable systolic thrill, and systolic brewy. He has normal breath sounds, lungs are clear, but he splint inspiration, complaining of pain on inspiration along with the right costal margin. First heart sound is normal, second heart sound is increase of A2 component. He has ejection click and grade four systolic ejection murmur in the upper right sternal border, radiating to the neck. No diastric murmur, abdomen negative. He has uh, extremities with two plus pulses, <clears throat> okay? And there is no bronchial femoral delay. Uh, there is no edema, no cyanosis or clubbing. ECG showed increased precordial voltage, so there is LVH. Chest X-ray is normal. Eco Doppler study shows 50 millimeter mercury mean aortic valve gradient. So the mean aortic valve gradient 50 millimeter mercury. And there is mobile dooming leaflet. 
there is my auto regurg auto valve area is one centimeter square my increase lv mass and the jacket fraction is over it is 75 percent there is no bricard effusion which one of the following is appropriate next a treat him symptomatically for viral infection discuss antibiotic prophylaxis and arrange follow-up visit b refer for auto valve replacement as soon as possible C, treat with penicillin and aspirin and start rheumatic fever prophylaxis. D, draw blood culture and initiate IV antibiotic for treatment of endocarditis. Okay, I'm waiting uh, the, the answer, no answer yet. So likely, as I said, a bit difficult question. Somebody said A. Okay. D. A and D. Third one said B. So now there is some like division of opinion. Uh, and there is one, somebody said bicuspid autic valve. So answer is B. Yeah, refer for autic valve placement as soon as possible. So I saw that now, uh, like uh, one answered A. And one answer D and two answers B. Any other answer? And there is D also, draw blood pressure. So, <clears throat> okay, good. So, uh, I will explain for you now the scenario, then I will come back. So, this patient has likely, from this, what they are, like, uh, uh, describing, this is like a viral illness. He said flu-like symptoms, and there is pleurisy or pruritus, very clear by sharp right side chest pain, and there is pleurisy, the patient will stop his breathing. His chest examination is clear and the X-ray clear lungs. So uh, who said bicuspid aortic valve? Likely, likely is correct because this patient is young and the uh, clinical exam is consistent with severe aortic stenosis and with bicuspid aortic valve. Okay, so likely now we are thinking about congenital aortic stenosis. So at this age is definitely not degenerative not digitive and but it could be rheumatic but likely no because the patient doesn't have any past history of rheumatic fever or rheumatic endocarditis at childhood he has a clear history before so let's now come do you have any other thing may suggest like infective endocarditis or the patient has any like underlying risk to have endocarditis uh, no the patient doesn't have any like prosthetic materials he's not IV drug abuser and he has no immunity. So the patient has severe now aortic stenosis by definition. Clinical exam is consistent. His mean grade 50, so any mean gradient more than 40 is consistent with severe AS. Any peak gradient more than 60 is consistent with severe AS. And the area, one or less, is consistent with severe aortic stenosis. And he has LVH, so it's long standing AS. So like now, we are talking about a chronic disease with some fever, okay? And this fever make the physician just to pick up the murmur incidentally. So now, why uh, anybody he wrote refer for autic valve replacement as soon as possible? Why you said this? Yeah, there is dooming. Dooming, yeah. Dooming is consistent with, as you said, bicuspid aortic valve, and there is a click. All of this clinical exam consistent with Bicuspid aortic valve, that's right. So like now we're talking about congenital AS, which is bicuspid here. We have ejection systolic click, and we have dooming. And even the age is suggestive of congenital aortic stenosis. So anybody right? why you say I'd refer for aortic valve placement as soon as possible? Okay, I will tell you this is not correct. Why? Anybody can write is not correct to do aortic valve replacement as soon as possible. Why? 
Asymptomatic can wait. Somebody said asymptomatic can wait. Okay, this is acceptable answer, but why? Again, I want explanation. No magician fraction. There is infection. <clears throat> okay. That's right. There is some infection. This is likely a viral infection or bacteria, however. So he can wait. Okay. So once you have fever or any suspicion of the carditis, you have not to do any surgery, even if there is viral infection. You have to wait. Type, can I ask you? Fever, lung disease with a blur CT. Okay. Now I have scenario that we treat this patient. He has just viral infection and treated, and he came to you after one month. He is very cleaned from infection. So can you do surgery now or better to wait? Exercise stress testing. Okay. <clears> Type. <throat> I will direct you. I will help you. Go back and see age of the patient, 15 year old. If you replace the valve now, what will happen to him? Anybody can just write the answer. Still 15 year degeneration. Okay, degeneration. This degeneration may happen after like 30 years or 20 years. Excellent. Somebody said PPM or mismatch. So remember, this patient 15 year old. If he will, he's growing. <coughs> Thank you so much. So don't replace valve unless if it is top emergency in pediatric age group until the age of 18 or 21 year. Because once you replace the valve now, you'll put size. The patient after a few years is different in, in like tall and in, in size and weight. So he quickly will develop patient processes mismatch. And here, the patient process mismatch is different. It's not the problem with the valve itself or the surgeon. Problem with the patient that increasing in size. Likely, he will duplicate over like a few years. So we have not to replace the valve now. Okay? And the patient is asymptomatic, as, 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 as uh, we said. Ejection fraction is still normal. So he can wait. I will give you a scenario. Suppose the patient now has some symptoms. He has like exertional shortness of breath high class two. What you have to do for him? And you are worried from patient procedures mismatch. What's the best action? Balloon, excellent. So we have to do balloon. Somebody said need to drop gene flash and increase systolic diameter. That's okay, yeah. But we can do just now gentle ballooning, balloon valvotomy, the same like when you are doing for rheumatic mitral stenosis. This will relieve the stenosis. Severe stenosis for a few years till again he will need like uh, valve surgery in the future. However, dealing with this age group is different from somebody who's 60, 70 year old or 50 who has asymptomatic severe autic stenosis or even moderate autic stenosis. Now there is like a new trend to do some early intervention for asymptomatic moderate to severe aortic stenosis. But those people are old. So they said mortality, mortality when uh, will increase if you wait for this patient. But this patient is young by cuspid, so he can wait till a drop of ejection fraction. So now I will give you the answer. Sorry, because I have some time, took a uh, longer time with this. Treat him symptomatically for viral infection, discuss antibiotic prophylaxis, and arrange follow-up visit. We can see him in the next visit. And this is the... Uh, explanation of my answers. As I told you, I will give you the slides or share to Dr. Brahim, he can share to others. <clears throat> Question eight. You hear I made diastolic rumble at the apex and a diastolic uh, decrescendo blowing murmur at the left sternal border in a patient with mild dyspnea on effort. The murmurs have been present for years. So which of these features suggest an Austin Flint member rather than organic mitral stenosis? This is, I think, very easy question. A, increased first heart sound intensity. B, atrial fibrillation. C, pre-systolic attenuation of rumble. B, blood pressure by cuff 160 over 50 or opening snap. Okay, as uh, I told, it's easy, but I think it's a bit difficult because now there are two answers, C, two answers, D. Any other suggestion other than C and D? 
C, אוקיי, C, C, D, אני אכתלף על עולם ה-A-O. טייב. So, E, opening snub, you know, as I told you before I start this presentation, that the answer usually in the question. So you have to understand the question, otherwise you will lose a lot of marks in the exam because like you did not understand the question. We said, which of these features suggest Austin Flint murmur? So Austin Flint murmur will happen in which disease? Suggestive of severe what? Severe aortic regurgitation, okay? Severe aortic regurgitation, excellent. So now the question, which of these five findings would suggest severe AR rather than organic mitostenosis or rheumatic mitostenosis? That means four of these findings are typical for rheumatic mitostenosis, severe, and one is only with severe AR. So increased intensity of first has sound is typical of severe MS. Atrial fibrillation will happen usually with severe MS because of dilated left atrium. Pre-systolic accentuation or attenuation of the rumble, this is also typical of severe mitostenosis rheumatic, and it will disappear in atrial fibrillation. And the blood pressure 160 over 50. What you notice here, as somebody said, this is wide pulse pressure, because any pulse pressure difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure more than 60 millimeter, this is wide pulse pressure. And this is suggestive of severe aortic regage or severe mitral regage. And E, finally, opening snap, which is also typical for severe rheumatic mitral stenosis. So the answer is E. Good. The answer is D. Okay. <clears throat> and this is the answer explanation. Question number nine. You are asked to consult on a patient hospitalized on the psychiatry service. She has been admitted because of severe anxiety and headache. The neurological uh, evaluation is negative with no evidence of an organic basis for her headache. She is on an ergot alkaloid for headache. She does have a history of shortness of breath and fatigue, most of which is attributed to her emotional status. On exam, blood pressure normal. There is increase in the pulse pressure following a premature ventricular contraction and a grade three systolic murmur with a faint early diastolic sound. Echocardiography study documents presence of moderately severe mitral regurg with some thickening of the valve. What is the pathology that is most likely to have caused this MR? Is it carcinoid heart disease? Is it ergot or ergotamine induced mitral incompetence? It is mitral stenosis, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with MR or tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Okay, excellent, B. Okay, as we said here, sometimes the answer here, the patient is psychic, taking medication, mainly he said this is like the alcohol alkaloid, this is well-known headache medication, it may cause valve disease, and the patient has mitral regurge, and also there is thickening of the valve. So there is degeneration of the valve, okay? So we have two factors or two causes etiology may cause early degeneration of one of the leaflets, mainly mitral valve or sometimes aortic or even pulmonic. Uh, one of them is the medication-induced valvopathy or radiation-induced valvopathy, which now is less common than the previous days, like 30 years ago, when the radiation was giving with no studies on the valves okay so now they are just protecting the heart and they are narrowing the field of radiation so this patient likely has some mr and ms as well because there is thickening thickening and there is also mitral regurg and the clinical exam suggests both of them so this is likely uh, ergot induced mitral incompetence always don't forget to ask about any drug the patient can cause if you don't have etiology clear so if you have any VAB disease with regurg and stenosis, you have to rule out unusual etiologies like a drug-induced, radiation-induced valvopathy, like amyloidosis, like carcinoid, like other diseases, and infiltrative disease as well. Question 10. 
52 year old woman goes into acute pulmonary edema after an auto accident. She has a mild concussion and bruises on her upper body. ECG shows sinus tachycardia and non specific STT changes. Physical exam shows blood pressure normal, pulse tachycardic, diffuse pulmonary rails, grade 2 early systolic murmur, and a third heart sound. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Ruptured papillary muscle. B. Acute myocardial infarction. C. Cardiac contusion. D. Non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And E. Pulmonary contusion. So, <clears throat> yeah. Correct. Many people said A and acute acute MR. Mm. Okay. I think nobody asked if this is acute MR or TR. So, do you think this is acute MR or TR? Anything here suggests uh, this is acute MR or TR? Because we just asked rupture papillary muscle. So which papillary muscle? We don't know. Okay. MR. Why you said MR? Sorry. Can you write why? Or open the mic. Who said acute MR? The presence of third heart sound, it could be because of just acute heart failure of left or right side of the heart. Both of them can give you third heart sound or galvanism. There is galvanism of left ventricle and galvanism of the right ventricle. And there is a grade 2 early systolic murmur. Okay, both can happen in acute MR or acute TR. And we have diffuse pulmonary rails. So likely acute MR, that's right, because of pulmonary rails. So uh, as you know, if you have any accident, okay, or like a traffic accident, you have to rule out, is it the cause of the pulmonary, uh, of the cardiac issue or the cardiac, like event is the cause of the cardiac accident, like the, if the patient has like cardiac syncope or whatever, or heart block, it may cause this. So don't take it easy, but here the findings are suggestive of acute that disease and uh, usually you have rupture papillary muscle either of the tricuspid valve which is more common or of the mitral valve and uh, usually will be also associated with flail leaflet always rupture papillary muscle is associated with the flow with the flail leaflet and the most common cause of rupture papillary muscle is is both myocardial infarction is infection massive infection And sometimes uh, it is idiopathic, but this is very rare. So this is the answer, rupture papillary muscle, and this is the explanation. And there is no evidence of myocardial infarction in ECG. Question 11. 50-year-old man referred with a murmur of aortic stenosis. An incidental finding on a routine physical exam. Okay, so it was discovered incidentally. The patient denies cardiac symptoms. The physical exam was unremarkable except for grade 4 late crescendo murmur, typical of aortic stenosis, and S4 gallop, and absent aortic sound. Blood pressure normal, resting ECG showed minimal ST and TD changes, but no voltage criteria for LVH. The Doppler echo showed mean gradient of 60 mm mercury with LV thickness of 1.3 mm. So there is LVH in echo. The aortic valve is grossly deformed and heavily calcified. The ejection fraction is normal. The patient underwent a Bruce protocol X-ray test and quit after five minutes because of dyspnea. So the failure image showed no defect. What is the most appropriate management strategy at this time? A, follow the patient with echo every six months. B, perform dubitamine stress echo. C, start in April. D, follow the patient with an exercise stress test every six months or recommend for aortic valve replacement. This is a very easy question, and everybody said A. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, exp explanation here that the patient has symptoms with exercise. However, I will give you just two scenarios. Like this scenario, sometimes he will not tell you, uh, just uh, recommend the autogravity replacement. He may tell you that send the patient for 
coronary angiography next step if this is the next step this is the correct answer that's mean you are preparing the patient for aortic valve replacement okay so if he did not mention anything about aortic valve replacement and he just mentioned send the patient for coronary study that's mean this is the answer because this is the one step further before uh, send the patient for AVR the other scenario of the patient is totally asymptomatic but he has severe aortic stones with high gradient he will not nowadays because of the new guidelines he will not ask you send the patient for AVR or keep the patient because now there is some debate however they said if the patient has degenerative aortic stenosis and there is LVH or small LV cavity it is now recommended class 2A to send the patient to AVR. So if you don't have other answer except AVR, but other answers or choices are not consistent with this, yeah, choose aortic valve replacement. Unless if he mentioned that, keep the patient for observation because this is another choice. Thallium is normal. Why? No, no, no. <clears throat> Uh, there is one a question here. He said, thallium is normal. Why we need cath? I'm not telling you in this scenario. I give you another scenario. If the patient has uh, like uh, severe aortic stenosis and he is telling you one of the choices to send the patient for coronary angiogram, that means he's preparing for him surgery. So you can choose this. If, if uh, he is not putting one of the choices for aortic valve replacement. Okay. So this is the answer, recommend AVR. This is the explanation. Question 12. 40-year-old <clears throat> woman present with aortic regurge due to myxomatous aortic valve. She is asymptomatic and has good exercise tolerance on a treat test. So we did exercise, it's good tolerance. Baseline echo reveals normal LV systolic function with estimated gene fraction 65% and normal LV volume and normal volume yes during serial trans thoracic now the question during serial trans thoracic echo follow up which one of the following is the first indices is expected to change and will be indication for avr a lv ejection fraction b lv volume c lv wall thickness d stress driven ejection fraction a tricuspid valve velocity <clears throat> okay somebody said a the other B, A, B, D. Okay. B, A. Okay, it's a bit, uh, looks like a, a tough question. Now, if somebody will ask you during follow-up of ECO, what you are looking for, we are looking for, of course, if the like volume of the aortic cage is increasing, but however, it's severe. So it is still not indication of surgery. Of course, if the patient becomes symptomatic, we have to do surgery. Or if he becomes like sedentary lifestyle, uh, we can ask for like uh, stress, physical stress exam. Okay. There's no rule for dubitamine for any regurgitation. Okay. As far as stenosis, always dubitamine. But for regurg, if you're not sure about symptoms, you can put the patient on treadmill and test his exercise. And sometimes you can check ejection fraction and volume by stress. However, however, you know that even in the normal population, if you are putting them on treadmill, the volume will increase, okay? But the ejection fraction also will increase. But if the patient has significant, like valve disease, the volume will increase, but ejection fraction will decrease on the other side. This is only for the physical, the physical uh, stress, like treatment. So the other indication to do uh, AVR, if the patient has drop of ejection fraction 50% or less, or the LV volume increase. But now the question, what do you think? Is AR is volume overload condition or this is pressure overload? Can you write? <clears throat> Both volume, yeah, this is volume overload, not not a stress, usually volume. If you have isolated regurgitation, either AR or MR, usually, usually it is volume overload. With, with time, it may be pressure, 
but if you don't have NAS and you usually you don't have hypertension because hypertension, systolic hypertension may be sometimes associated with uh, like severe regurgitation of aortic valve. So if you don't have systolic hypertension, you don't have AS, usually it is volume overload, the same for, uh, for M, uh, mitral regurg. So both these regurgitation, AR and MR, will cause usually volume overload. But if you have severe hypertension or severe aortic stenosis, this is pressure overload. So the first one will be changed over time is the LV volume. Sometimes we find that LV volume becomes severely dilated in severe AR while the ejection fraction is still normal. So ejection fraction drop is late finding. So the first one we expect that it will be change is the LV volume, and, but both of them, LV ejection fraction and volume, are indication to go for aortic valve replacement as well as stress-driven ejection fraction, which is very uncommon to see in severe aortic regurg. So the answer is B, LV volume. Okay, this is the answer. <clears throat> Question 13, please. We have now four scenario. You have to choose one of them. So the following hemodynamic data were obtained in patient with isolated valvular aortic stenosis. Which of the following is consistent with severe AS? So we have four scenario. Three of them are not severe AS, but one of them is severe AS. Scenario A. The mean gradient across the aortic valve is 23 millimeter mercury with cardiac index of 3 liter per minute per meter square and normal LV ejection fraction. However, before going to the next, you see all of these mean gradients are on the moderate range to make it easy for you. We don't have any severe range here. As I said, mean gradient 40 or more is consistent with severe AS and peak and peak, uh, if peak more than 60 is severe S. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, all of these uh, gradients are in moderate range. So, number A, mean gradient across the aortic valve 23, and cardiac test is 3. B, mean gradient across the aortic valve 28, and cardiac index 1.8, and after dubitamine infusion, aortic valve gradient is 28, and the cardiac index became 3. C, mean gradient across the aortic valve is 32 millimeter mercury and cardiac index 1.5. Ejection fraction, 28%. After dubutamine, mean gradient across the aortic valve is 50 and cardiac index is a 3. D, mean gradient across the aortic valve is 25 and cardiac index 1.9. Ejection fraction, 35. After dubutamine, mean gradient became 27 and there is no change in ejection fraction. Okay, yeah, I think all of you answered correctly. C, 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 C. D2, D2. Okay. So the correct answer is C, that's right. Okay. Uh, can I choose one of who said C and to tell me why? Because I want just uh, to share. Top anybody, please, who answers C can open the mic on only and tell me why. I want explanation. Or you can write here increase in cardiac index, increase in mean gradient, low flow, low gradient through S. Okay, so number one, you have to know that if the gradient less than 40, and still you have suspicion of severe aortic stenosis by 2D finding, like severe calcified valve, and the patient has symptoms and signs of AS, and the NICO you have severe aortic stenosis by findings of 2D, like restricted opening, like you have very calcified valves or whatever, degenerative valve, or drop of ejection fraction, <clears throat> then the gradient is low, you have to look what's the problem here. So now I'm telling you about the cardiac index. He may give you just the cardiac index or the cardiac output. Here the cardiac index is three. So what's the normal cardiac index for any patient? Anybody can write here? So we have to check if the cardiac index is low or normal. The normal cardiac index is, uh, index is 2.2. 2. 
liter per meter per square. Okay, and sometimes we are going to yeah more than two point two excellent. This is the normal. If less than two point two, this is low cardiac index. However, we are usually measuring and equal the stroke volume, and if the stroke volume is less than thirty three mil per, we are measuring by mil here. We are not measuring by by liter. Thirty three milliliter per beat okay then we are like just uh, calculating or multiplying by how many uh, beat per minute and we are giving you the cardiac output then the cardiac index we are dividing by the body mass index so we can uh, measure cardiac index by echo as well so scenario a the patient has normal index okay and no magician fraction so uh, mean grade is in moderate range, so this is less likely to have severe aortic stenosis. B, the patient has low cardiac index, less than 2.2, and you have moderate range of uh, like a gradient. Ejection fraction is low, okay? So we have to send the patient to dubitamine. This is, this is likely low flow, low gradient, okay? Aortic stenosis. But we did not calculate the area. However, we don't know if it's severe or or moderate. They send the patient to, to dubutamine. What happened with dubutamine? Cardiac output normalized and became like a double than the usual, the, the baseline. And still the aortic valve grain is 28 in moderate. So this is likely if the calculated area was severe, this is called pseudo severe aortic stenosis. Okay. Or this is just a moderate aortic stenosis. Now, our answer is C, because this patient has also moderate range of like gradient and very low cardiac output. Ejection fraction is very low, 28 person. What do we mean? What happened? The cardiac out uh, index improved, normalized, and the mean grip became 50. Okay, so this is consistent with true severe aortic stenosis. Sometimes in the exam, he may bring for you gradient or he may bring the area. If the area is still less than one, this is severe aortic stenosis or the indexed area, indexed aortic valve area less than 0 0.6. So, <clears throat> so what's the definition of likely severe uh, AS by dubitamine stress? If the area we said less than one or index less than 0 0.6 or the mean gradient more than 30. Once mean, gra mean gradient more than 30, this is suggestive of severe uh, true aortic stenosis. Okay, okay, last scenario D. Mean gradient is 25, low cardiac output, low ejection fraction after dubutamine, mean gradient did not change, almost the same, and no change of ejection fraction. So is it severe or this is moderate? Excellent. Why? And uh, this is not determined. Why we cannot determine this? Cannot tell? Yeah, we cannot tell, yes, why? Because there is no improvement of cardiac output. So this is likely failed to raise the fraction, that's right. We call this, this is poor contractile reserve of LV. The LV cannot produce or generate more power. So this is poor prognostic sign. Okay, uh, just I have to correct you. The recent guidelines in ECO mentioned the stroke volume 33 or less, considered as low stroke volume index, of course. Old, we are measuring 35, no 33. I think this is the last question, or can I ask you, do you like me to continue? I have still like uh, five questions, or go to the, just to the ECO cases, ECO quiz. Can we take just like anybody can write? Sure. Yes, please continue. Okay, because what I understood that. Uh, question number 14. <clears throat> you are responsible for the care of a vigorous 72 year old man with acquired degenerative calcific vapor aortic stenosis, accompanied by matter regurgitation and calcification of the matter annulus. So now we are talking about degenerative AS and degenerative mitral regurgitation, and there is also a MAC. He has survived infective endocarditis with multiple positive culture for streptococcus mutants. 
which you just to be dental origin. Although there had been no specific dental intervention related temporally with the onset of symptom, based on CAF data completed during his antibiotic course, you feel uh, that aortic valve replacement and inspection of the mitral valve and adjacent structures are indicated. The patient has 11 remaining teeth that are in poor repair. So which one of the following is the best plan? A, ignore the dental status and difference to the more serious viral heart disease. That's mean, ignore dental status and send the patient for AVR and uh, just explanation and see the mitral valve. B, discharge the patient to the care of his dentist to permit cautious dental extraction of one to two teeth per visit. C, schedule full mouth extraction well in advance for the anticipated cardiac surgery. D, schedule full mouth extraction synchronous with cardiac surgery, thus avoiding a second anesthesia. Or E, delay all dental procedures until after cardiac surgery. Okay, uh, you said C, that's right. Why C, dental care first, then surgery? Why you said C? Just because of simple dental care or something else? Are you answering C because this is a routine before uh, dive surgery? Or do you have a reason in this patient? High risk, as yeah, yeah, excellent. Because he has a previous endocarditis, and this is like the source, so it is unsafe to send the patient to any valve surgery without just uh, cleaning this. And the patient likely has multiple positive culture with typical organism, Streptococcus, uh, okay, very dense or mutants. This is typical for endocarditis from dental or mouth origin. So we have to clean this before surgery. However, now the guidelines is less restrict, okay, to just uh, have like a dental case before any surgery, valve surgery. But uh, if you are sending the patient, especially for mechanical mitral valve, please, as always, you have to ask the dental clearance and remove all the teeth and do all the dental workup before putting the patient, especially mitral valve replacement with mechanical valve, because. Uh, the patient will come and go many times after surgery for dental clearance or for just managing the teeth. He should hold warfarin and resume warfarin. This will uh, like uh, increase the risk of thrombosis of the valve. Question 15, 60 year old woman with history of mild rheumatic mitral valve disease present to the emergency department with palpitation, shortness of breath and fatigue. 12 lead ECG demonstrate typical atrial flutter with 2 to 1 AV conduction. And echo in the emergency department demonstrate both mitral stenosis and mitral regurg, but both are of moderate severity. And she doesn't have elevated right sided pressure. Blood pressure is a bit in lower range. Heart rate is tachycardic 150. So this is atrial flutter 2 to 1 block or conduction. On careful questioning, the patient has no idea as to when her arrhythmia began or palpitation. Her symptoms developed gradually over the last several days. Your initial treatment would be, A, admit the patient to the hospital for initiation of heparin and digitalis, B, administration in the ER or emergency department for intravenous ebutilide for acute arrhythmia termination, C, provide the patient with a, a prescription for a beta blocker and comedin and discharge her from the emergency department, D, admit the patient to hospital for heparin, TE, and possible pharmacological or electrical cardioversion. Excellent. Uh, the answer is DY because, good. So this is mitral stenosis, and the patient likely ha will have dilated left atrium. So this is considered as high risk for like thrombosis and thromboembolism. The patient has atrial flutter, so the patient has risk for showering. However, digital is, is usually is uh, useless in case of a flutter, okay? This is good for just uh, like um, 
AV nodal block in case of atrial fibrillation will decrease the heart rate, but it is less effective in a flutter. And uh, the patient should be admitted for T and rule out left atrium or left atrial appendage clot because he doesn't know doesn't know exactly the duration or the like beginning of his symptoms. So likely it is more than 48 hours. Okay, this is, I think, easy and usual question. Bridge to warfarin. Now, of course, we have to give the patient war a heparin and then to start warfarin after finish of the TE, of course. And uh, if, the, for example, you are giving cardioversion and uh, the patient is young and he came back to normal sinus after electric cardioversion, for how many months or weeks you will continue the anticoagulation or you have to continue forever? One month, three months, four weeks. Again, I'll repeat my question. The patient, excellent. So this is the answer, unless high child vasc. I did not mention the patient has low uh, child vasc. I mentioned young patient. So this young patient may have a stroke before. So this is child vasc uh, too, or his diabetic or. So always mention high child vasc. If child vasc is high, it's better to continue till further assessment in the future. We don't know. He may have paroxysmal, AFib or flutter. So he, you have to continue forever. But if the patient child vasc is low, like zero, and just he has acute event, you can continue this uh, anticoagulation by warfarin or wax for four weeks. Unless if he has like this patient mitral stenosis, you have to put him on on warfarin. <clears throat> However, this patient has mitral stenosis, so likely he will have paroxysmal atrial arrhythmia, flutter or fibrillation. So we prefer in this scenario to continue. Uh, till you treat the cause. Question 16. Moderate MS need lifelong regardless. Yeah, yeah. You are right. I, I mentioned this. Uh, yeah, moderate MS, of course. Unless in one scenario, you can stop anticoagulation. Can you tell me this scenario in rheumatic MS? In which scenario you can stop anticoagulation? Watchman. Oh my God. No, no, please remove this question. Endocarditis. <clears throat> no, I'm talking uh, if the patient has no catastrophic, like, like uh, if the patient has hemorrhage, of course, you have to stop anticoagulation. If the patient has infective endocarditis, usually we have to just Stop warfarin, but give him, but give him what heparin infusion. So I'm talking about all anticoagulation. When I can stop anticoagulation, and when I manage as a part of management of the <laughs> this valve, valvotomy, watchman. Number one, watchman is contraindicated in presence of any rheumatic mitral valve. Even if you have mild mitral stenosis, watchman is contraindicated. Okay, because it is high risk to have thrombosis of this watchman. So you have to continue like warfarin. Okay. Uh, doctor, if, please, uh, can I ask you? Are, just after uh, one minute. <clears throat> if even in case of valvotomy, in case of valvotomy of mitral stenosis, you have to continue anticoagulation. Okay. So valvotomy is not correct. Watchman is not correct. Endocarditis, no. Okay. But, yeah, go ahead. Ask, please. Pregnancy? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, there is one correct answer, which is maze. You switch to urban. Excellent. Maze procedure. So if you are replacing... No, no. It's not co complete. Maze plus if you are replacing the mitral valve with tissue valve. <clears throat> okay. So if you are replacing the mitral valve with tissue valve, and the patient doesn't have high risk. I mean, he doesn't have now measure the chad vasc after mass surgery. And you are just doing ligation and undersizing, okay, of the left atrium. 
with major procedure ligation of the left atrial appendage. Now there is debate that is you can continue or stop if the patient has a bit higher risk of bleeding, you can stop safely. Many studies show that it is safe to stop this. <clears throat> okay, the pregnancy. No, you can you can continue often during pregnancy at five uh, or less, or you can continue with coagulation. Click send. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a question, please? It's just uh, doctor. I'm asking uh, uh, regarding this case. Uh, uh, now we are uh, we are already talking about the vulvar MS. We have moderate MS with AP or atrial flutter. Do we need to calculate uh, chart bars to to prescribe the patient anticoagulation? <clears throat> No, no, or of regardless no, no. of uh, chat no, bars. No, now no, we are talking about moderate MS. La, yeah, yeah, yeah. La, this is serious. And you, if you have moderate MS or severe, don't mention chat vask. Chat vask if you don't have MS or if you have just mild mitral stenosis, okay? And you don't have LA dilatation. But now, with many questions, I'm giving you another scenario. So I'm just asking about a young patient. So don't be confused. I finish from the question, then I ask about young patient who had uh, like uh, this scenario with just a flutter or fibrillation and you give him cardiovirgin and he doesn't have MS. So do I need to continue the, the warfarin for or anticoagulation for how many weeks? The answer is according to his chad vask. Okay. But if the patient has rheumatic mitral stenosis, you have to continue forever. Okay, if the patient has high chat vask, you have to continue forever, even if you are converting to sinus. Uh, even they said after ablation of AFib, still it's recommended to continue, not to stop. Okay, then if the patient has low chat vask, like zero or just one, you can just uh, continue for four weeks only. So if you have any rheumatic moderate to severe rheumatic mitral stenosis, don't mention chat vask. This is very incorrect. Okay, now the time is empty. Let me go to the next question. Okay, 17. <clears throat> Just I have two questions more, then I will finish, inshallah. You are mentioning D? <laughs> Just I, I skipped that question. Question 17, 25 year old white woman experiences rapid onset of severe shortness of breath. Within two days, she cannot walk one block without having to stop because of dyspnea. She has been well until this occurred. Physical exam, blood pressure is almost normal. Pulse is uh, tachycardic. Respiratory rate is normal. Neck veins are seven centimeters, so it is dilated. JVB, lungs raised bilaterally. Uh, up to posteriorly, there is a grade four harsh cystic member, loudest at the apex, but very well hard uh, in the second intercostal space, left sternal border. And there is also a short grade, grade two diastolic low frequency member at the apex. Lab and chest x ray are normal. Okay, the heart size is upper uh, limit of normal size. There is bilateral pulmonary edema. ECG non specific T wave changes. So now the question the most likely eco Doppler finding is A, systolic jet across the aortic valve 5 meter per second, B, diastolic jet across the mitral valve 2.5 meter per second, C, a diastolic jet filling the outer flow tract of the LV, D, a systolic sub valvular jet in the LV outer flow tract of 4 meter per second. Or a systolic jet across the mitral valve of 4.2 meter per second. Okay, just I'm giving you time to think. Now we have answer of B, C, B. <clears throat> so, 
so any answer more just be somebody only maybe it's a bit difficult question so let's go back to the scenario this is a young female who had just likely likely we are talking now and about acute event the rapid onset of severe shortness of breath and the patient has pulmonary edema okay she is tachycardic and you have murmur and jvb is high so like you know we are talking about acute what heart failure and likely about, about acute usually acute uh, heart failure like this scenario and there is murmur regardless of the murmur you think it is acute stenosis or acute regurg okay both of them may happen but most of the time is acute regurg and likely acute regurg will happen because of like papillary muscle rupture myocardial infarction okay or vegetation like you have acute aortic regurg flail aortic valve or flail mitral valve or whatever Stenosis usually very rare to cause acute symptoms unless if you have bulky like mass okay the patient was asymptomatic left atrial myxoma and now is obstructing the the uh, mitral valve causing functional mitral stenosis or you have a big vegetation of the aortic valve and now causing again functional aortic stenosis but the scenario here doesn't suggest any any vegetation or infectum carditis the patient doesn't have fever so, so like now we're talking about acute mitral regurg, excellent. Acute mitral regurgitation, regardless of the cause. So, the patient has, we said, it's loudest. I think you, uh, this question confusing you because he mentioned like many locations and many types of murmur. But see, the patient has grade four harsh cystic murmur, loudest at the apex. So, like you are talking about now, mitral regurgitation, okay? loudest at the apex and sometimes according to the murmur especially if you have very eccentric murmur especially with presence of like papillary muscle rupture or flail the murmur is usually very eccentric could be anterior directed or posterior so if it's anterior directed it may like uh, transferred or radiated anteriorly to the anterior or left sternal border and this is what happened here very well hard in the second intercostal space. So like you are talking about now, flail mitral valve, especially flail anterior mitral leaflet. And there is diastolic low frequency murmur at the apex as well, because this is sometimes will happen with acute and severe regurgitation. So now this is acute MR. I'm telling you the diagnosis. Back, can you now give me the answer out of these five? I have now severe MR. So which one you select? Is it systolic jet across the aortic valve of five meter per second? The answer is no. This is what? Systolic jet across the aortic valve of five meter. That means that this is the big velocity. This is aortic stenosis. Or this is a diastolic jet across the mitral valve of 2.5. This is mitral stenosis. Or this is a diastolic jet filling uh, the outer flow tract of the LV. This is aortic regurg. Or D, systolic subvalvular jet in the LV outer flow tract of 4 meter per second. This is what? If somebody mentioned for you systolic subvalvular jet in the LV outflow, this is likely you are talking about LV OT obstruction or Hawkeye. So E, systolic jet across the metal valve of 4.2 meter. So this is the answer. Okay. This is the answer. Severe MR. Okay, I think this is the last question. Question 18. So, patient 60 year old Hispanic woman who has a history of one year of progressive shortness of breath on activity. For the past two months, she has been having trouble sleeping and is now sleeping sitting up in a chair. So, this is significant orthopnea and PND. She has occasional chest discomfort lasting up to 15 minutes at times associated with activity, but other times occurring at rest even. She has history of 20 years of smoking and history of heavy alcohol use for 10 years, stopping five years ago. Past medical history, she described illness at age of six years, which was, I think this is the answer here, if you see, age of six, which she has, was told uh, that she had rheumatic fever, physical exam, blood pressure normal, 
she is tachycardic, lungs respiratory wheezes, and rails have way up, uh, up both lung phase posteriorly. Uh, in neck vein examination, she has large V wave up to 15 centimeter. The point of maximum impulse is not palpable, but there is a precordial lift. S1 is normal, S2 is loud and single. There is no extra sounds. There is a grade two systolic ejection murmur along the left sternal border at the third and fourth intercostal space that increases with inspiration. Liver is down 10 centimeter with systolic pulsation. There is one beating edema. <clears throat> Lab chest X-ray modality in large cardiac solutity with double density along the right cardiac border, pulmonary vascular re redistribution, and interstitial edema. ECG, there is right axis deviation. <clears throat> Okay, uh, uh, and the LA abnormality. Echo shows large left atrium, large right atrium, and dilated right ventricle. So the echo doubler would show, in addition to the above, which of the following? A, obstructive mass in the right pulmonary artery, extending into the main pulmonary artery. B, atrial septal defect. C, four meter per second diastolic jet across the mitral valve in the estuary. D, thickened calcified polymobile metal valve, or E, a kinetic true posterior LV wall. D, B, A. To touch of Falou. Somebody mentioned touch of Falou. Okay. So any more, any answer? Now there is deg deviation, C, B, C. So somebody answered C, the other B, A, D. So, mashallah, yani all the answers now. Uh, this is the last question, so. F, somebody answer F. I think uh, F would be answered in the exam or after the exam. Okay, a few days after the exam. Right. So go back. Uh, anybody can tell me what's if somebody asks you without this answer, what's the main uh, pathology of this patient in one word? What's the main VAP disease here? Can you write? What do you think from this the history? MS, yeah, that's right. Yeah, rheumatic, rheumatic MS, rheumatic mitral valve. <clears throat> so better to mention rheumatic. Okay, the patient at age of six, she had rheumatic fever. Okay, because she said that she has like a fever at age of uh, uh, six year here, and or illness at six of year rheumatic fever. And the patient is Hispanic women. This Hispanic usually, like in our community or our uh, any third world, they have high risk of rheumatic heart disease. So whatever mentioned here, most of the signs are consistent with severe MS in echo and in uh, clinical exam, complicated by significant pulmonary hypertension, large V wave, so severe TR as well. So once the patient, he said that there is some, okay, grade two here, systolic ejection murmur along the left sternal border at the third and fourth interscostal space that increase with inspiration. What do you think? Because somebody answer B is ASD, as they usually will have what? You will have pansystolic murmur, okay? And likely now we are talking about TR, right? because TR in some cases, it could be just what? It could be uh, like ejection systolic murmur. Uh, number two, the patient has signs of heart failure like pitting edema, as I mentioned. But most of the signs are consistent with severe MS, like uh, S2 is loud and single. Okay, usually S1. I'm not sure about this, what he mentioned. So is it now rheumatic MS associated with also rheumatic MR? It could be. Is it rheumatic MS complicated with severe TR and prohibitation, it could be. Is it MS and 
also there is aortic stenosis rheumatic it could be because you have s2 is loud and single okay so all of the scenario is possible so that's why now he's just giving you other scenarios or answer not consistent with any of these except that the patient has severe ms so the answer is d thickened calcified polymobile mitral valve so the answer is a wrong why obstructive mass in the right primary artery extends into, into the main primary artery this is just consistent with like uh, primary embolism which nothing suggests here the patient has for many years had these symptoms asd we mentioned is not correct <clears throat> c Somebody mentioned this is MS, so the patient has four meter per second diastolic jet across the mitral valve in diastole. Yes, in diastole you have likely a jet in case of mitral stenosis, like here, but this number is impossible. This is much higher than what we have seen in mitral stenosis. The maximum uh, jet velocity in diastole across the mitral valve will not exceed never a three, because once you have four, that's mean the peak velocity is 4 meter per second that's equal to 64 millimeter mercury in diastole this will never happen in, in mitral stenosis okay this is very very high gradient so this four is always is an aortic stenosis not a mitral stenosis and a, a kinetic true posterior view all nothing suggests this okay thank you so much i finished this part uh, i'm not sure about uh, what Clues for MS. One question regarding valve pregnancy. Type. Let's go to the question. One question regarding valve in pregnancy. You mentioned it's early in pregnancy with MS. If balloon will be done, need Wilkin score? Of course. Of course. During pregnancy, you need Wilkin score. <clears throat> if the patient has Wilkin score more than 12, is not suitable, don't do. You can send the patient to surgery. And if the patient is a pulmonary edema, however, the indication for uh, intervention pregnancy is very limited, unless if the patient has very good Wilkin score with severe symptomatic MS, you can do balloon. If the patient has like uh, pulmonary edema, or she is in left side heart failure very clear, or she has very fast FIB you cannot control, or arrhythmia, you can uh, assess the Wilkin score. If it is very high. You can do mitral valve surgery. I think we had one patient in our hospital. We did for her uh, mitral valve replacement, one or two patients during surgery because the Wilkins score was very high. <clears throat> and the patient will die if you are not treating this. Okay. However, if you are lucky, you have to detect the patient before like uh, age of 120, the same age 120 days, and you have to discuss with them the termination, especially if you are sending the patient to surgery, termination issues. But if the more than 120, this is legal issue and ethical, and uh, discuss with them that the patient may have died, uh, like if she need like uh, CS later, so better to do now MVR. But we are talking now about very severe mitral stenosis, very catastrophic mitral stenosis. Uh, I think there is no time for this echo because once I start, uh, it is very long. Or if you want to have 30 minutes up to you. However, uh, if you want to have other time to be arranged, also I'm ready. Uh, and, and especially if you, because you don't have time, you have this promotion exam. Uh, so we can arrange on like Saturday morning, for example, or other day or even after the exam, because I will not present this as eco coding, rather that interesting eco, which you may have in your exam, because, you know, even MCQs, you will have some scenarios like MCQ, and there is eco or ECG or CAF. This is part of your exam. Thank you so much, Zakumullah Khair. If you have any question, uh, I think you can now uh, open the mic and ask.
اوكي اي ثينك نو كويستشن جزاكم الله خير وان شاء الله بالتوفيق ونسال الله دائما يوفقكم في الدنيا والاخره وفي اختباراتكم بارك الله فيكم السلام عليكم